diffuse to the chain. Okay, so thanks. I would like to first uh, thanks the organizer for inviting me to this uh, uh, great meeting. It has been a lot of fun so far. <coughs> and um, okay, so this is work done. So I'm now at the University of Strasbourg. I just moved recently. This is work done uh, um, in collaboration with several people who are uh, in Innsbruck. And also, Marcelo Belmonte, who was a student and our postdoc in uh, Innsbruck. Uh, Alexander Gletzle, who was also a great student uh, in um, uh, Botsau, a postdoc. Uh, in the group of Peter Zola uh, in Innsbruck. Okay, so um, this is, um, we're going to talk about polar molecules and trimer liquids and crystals. So polar molecules here, I just want to define what kind of molecules you are thinking of. These are closed shell molecules in the electronic and vibrational ground state. And as we are very excited about the fact that well, they have permanent uh, dipole moments, and so it is possible to align them using external fields. And so uh, this can give rise if you take two molecules to uh, interactions which are uh, long range, <coughs> so they decay like one over a cube, and they are in isotropic, which means uh, this can uh, introduce several features in uh, both collisions and body physics. In collisions, as usual, if two particles collide in plane, they repel each other, and if they collide out of plane, they uh, attract each other, and this can give rise to interesting phenomena, but also some, inch, uh, some bad uh, phenomena like instability in both two body and many body systems. So, okay, I will start with this kind of slides, uh, just to remind where we are coming from and uh, why we're doing, uh, we are looking at this kind of systems. Um, so, a few years ago, we set up to study this kind of uh, new system which we're emerging, and right now uh, there are several experiments in the field. Um, okay, so, as we said, we have this, uh, the, the main feature here is that we have the polar interaction, so the first question is about stability, and um, so one idea to stabilize interaction is to put particles to dimensions. And so later on, we're going to look at situations in which we have uh, particles polarized by some field in some direction. And then we have a collinear optical lattice which confines the particles, for example, to two dimensions or also one dimensions. Now, this can help to do two things. First, it uh, can help stabilize uh, the, um, the, the two-body system, many-body system against the elastic collision. And this is another slide that we've been putting up for the last couple of years, which is um, if you want to actually uh, stabilize interaction between two particles, uh, for example, potassium rubidium particles, as realized at GILA, it's a chemical reaction at short range. And now, um, the way in which you can do it, you can put it in this configuration, and this means the following, that you can, now the interaction potential between two particles is comprising a confinement, which is given by the optical lattice in the third direction, Z. Maybe you have some centrifugal barrier coming from maybe the, 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 the statistics of the particles. Uh, you have a Van der Waals attraction and then a dipole-dipole interaction. And now, um, if you just plot this interaction potential here, and this is, a, this is a contour plot, and now blue means a strong repulsion, and white, a weak repulsion, and here, attraction. Here, the z direction, and here is the, the distance in, we are in cylindrical coordinate because we have cylindrical symmetry. So distance between the two particles. So if you now plot this potential here, you see immediately the following thing. This is a z equal to zero, so it means we are in, in, in the plane. Uh, if two particles want to collide along the plane, they, they, they see in the presence of a small, just a small uh, dipole moment, maybe 0 0.2 dBi as realizable in Gila, they see a repulsion here, which, comes from the, which is a blue dot here, which comes from the dipole-dipole interaction. While out, out of the plane, then of course, they see the repulsion coming from the uh, optical lattice. And so now if two particles want to follow the path of minimal action, which is uh, this one, they will try to collide going out of plane and try to reach the region at short range where they can undergo chemical reaction. Now they have to go out of the plane, and, and then we see basically a saddle point in between two maxima, which is one given by the double level interaction and one by the external potential. And therefore, all the calculation of the uh, inelastic cross-section, inelastic rates, recombination rates, can be reduced in certain limits. Uh, to basically calculation of the tunneling probability of a particle um, through the saddle point here, through the barrier at the saddle point. And so one can do that, and in the limit in which a dipole length is a larger scale, um, one gets this uh, nice uh, exponential suppression of inelastic collision, and therefore basically this only says that if you have uh, a dipole length, which is defined here as uh, the mass multiplied by dipole squared, uh, divided by the harmonic oscillator length, which is defined here. Basically, uh, as if you, can, you can essentially suppress the inelastic collision between any kind of molecules as long as you have large enough di dipole moment or large enough confinement in the, in the system. And so, basically, this tells you that no matter what kind of molecules you have, 
if you have strong enough confinement in the third direction, for example, you should be able, and a little bit of dipole, you should be able to uh, stabilize the system against the elastic collision. Now, this kind of situation has been now confirmed by the experimental data from GILA. Okay, I said that then uh, the next thing was to start, uh, actually our goal also today is to do many body physics, and so the next thing is to study uh, what kind of phenomena one can have with the interacting dipole. For example, in two dimension, one thing we've been looking at was few years ago was the possibility of having a superfluid to crystal quantum phase transition. If one takes a, a bunch of bosons in two dimension, this is the phase diagram, and you can have, um, here you have temperature, units of interaction uh, energy and interparticle distance, and here you have the interaction to kinetic energy ratio, which goes like the dipole squared mass over interparticle distance. So by compressing, uh, by compressing a superfluid of dipolar bosons, by compressing more and more, the system becomes interacting and one can undergo a superfluid to crystal quantum phase transition. Actually, surprisingly, this is so interesting. This is not probably the end of this phase diagram. So this is a rough phase diagram. It's possible that there are additional phases in these systems, like in between these two phases, there may be an additional phase, and uh, above all, in the melting of the system, there could be an exotic phase in two dimension, but basically this is a rough phase diagram that people could see. For example, with rubidium cesium. But now, so of course, the field from, from in the last few years have been having like a, 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 there was a spark of interest in this kind of systems. And so there are a lot of study now of um, you know, quantum phase transition to dimensional geometry from several groups studying both bosons and fermions. And so observing uh, crystallization, for example, also fermions. And now the, the field has moved um, towards studying more complex uh, geometries. And for example, one very relevant is to have particles which are not just confined to a, a single layer of a lattice, but they uh, occupy several layers of lattices. And so there are um, several groups uh, set up to study the physics in this kind of system. And here now, if you take, the, the main result is that if you take, for example, a two-dimensional geometry and you have particles in two different layers, there is always a bound state for interlayer pairing. And so you can have now, um, pairing of particles, which are bosons or fermions, across uh, the various uh, layers. <laughs> so this gives rise to a lot of an interesting phenomena. So the kind of things that uh, I got interested in looking at, we got, what got interested in looking, is the following. So OK, here uh, we can always have now a bound set for two particles. Um, can we do something uh, different or something more? So is it the only kind of bound states that you can get in this kind of systems? <laughs> Or can you also have maybe bounce, bounce states of more than two, two particles only, maybe just one particle and two particles, three particles, or four particles, etc. And can um, and this is probably true, especially in, in lower dimensions. And so we expect that this will be true. And then we also ask ourselves, can, can this kind of um, little clusters of new uh, composite molecules, like we can see each one of these like a bigger molecule, say, can this kind of guys uh, make a stable uh, liquid, a stable uh, many-body system. They can interact as a whole, uh, um, you know, bigger systems. So basically, can we, can we realize stable liquids made of multimers and not see, a, in contrast, say, of seeing uh, um, just uh, they try to combine few body physics of the of the formation of this kind of molecules, bigger molecules, with the many-body physics of having liquid and crystals of this object. And so. Uh, we're going to talk about this work. Uh, there is also very much related work from the group of, um, of uh, Eugene Demler. Um, we basically found out uh, at, a, at a meeting that we were working on the same things. And, and then we ended up publishing also after the other. OK, so if, time, if there will be time at the end, probably not, as I'm talking very slow, uh, I want to also give a, a short summary about uh, uh, some re very recent work about cooling of molecules which is another relevant topic for this conference. And the idea here is to try to find ways to, to bridge a gap for molecules which are not just the usual um, so uh, bialkaline molecules in the, in the energy range, temperature range between a few millikelvin to microkelvin temperature. This would have an, an, a very interesting application for cold chemistry, for example, cold control chemistry. And the idea here is, uh, is the following, is to achieve a very efficient cooling, possibly, using um, molecules, um, ground state molecules in a mixture with uh, atoms, which are admixed to a Rydberg state. And basically, we have a situation in which a fast molecule scatter uh, against a, a gas of, of very cold atoms. And, and basically, the, the, we have a kind of a laser assisted blue shielding. So the blue shielding means that <laughs> an atom is, um, is uh, excited to a molecule, to an, a Rydberg state, conditional to a molecule coming close to uh, to the atom itself, and so 
this can increase uh, the atom molecule cross-section maybe uh, a few orders of magnitude and also protect from short-range collisions. And so, and also we can maybe try to engineer ways in which uh, uh, we provide photon assist and elastic collisions in such a way that every time that an atom and a molecule encounter each other, uh, we have excitation of the atom to a reverse state and then also spontaneous emission from the excited state and then a photon takes away the collision energy and so we have kind of a combination of sympathetic cooling and also uh, Sisyphus-like cooling. Okay, so this is about uh, trimer liquids and crystal in polar molecules. Okay, so what is the basic chemical? The basic is the following. We are going to look at it uh, from now on. So we have two wires. We look at one-dimensional geometries. So we have molecules which are polarized perpendicular to the wire, and, this, and they are separated by a distance g, and, uh, and this is basically a geometry. So they interact with a dipole-dipole interaction across uh, the wire, say so intra-wire and inter-wire inter are all the polar interaction. And so we have a single wire, single wire Hamiltonian. Alpha is, tells you what, what uh, wire you are, alpha one or alpha two. And in each wire, we have the following Hamiltonian. We have the kinetic energy term, we have the possibility of having some corrugation potential along the wires, which is an optical lattice, for example. Um, and then we have dipole-dipole interaction in the wire. So we have, it's proportional to the dipole squared of each one of these molecules and the density, density interactions. And this can be either bosons or fermions. And then we also have interwire couplings. So dipole-dipole um, interaction across the tubes with the usual uh, angular dependence can couple this molecule to this molecule. Now, this kind of Hamiltonian is valid in, the situa in a low density situation in which basically um, the, the characteristic length for the distance between the particles is much larger than uh, the uh, a length defined by the saddle point position that we have seen before in the blue potential. This is the position of the saddle point that we had before. And if you put now numbers for, if you have confinement in the, in, uh, given by the optical lattice of about maybe 100 kilohertz, this is true for if you take a little cesium molecules, which have a 5.5 uh, uh, device, um, then uh, uh, your characteristic length at which this theory is, is valid is about maybe three, larger than 360 nanometers or so, 400 nanometers. So you have to be pretty dilute in order for this system to work. Okay, but if, if this kind of condition are satisfied, then this is basically the microscopic Hamiltonian. Now, this is a... Uh, the strategy that we're going to use to understand what is going on uh, is the following. We get some analytical insight by looking at this kind of coupled systems, and then we get a, a full solution uh, in a lattice, which, which is what we can do, and we'll see below using the energy techniques how we can do that. So the point is that analytically, one can do the following thing. One can basically solve almost exactly the, I mean, the, the, the physics for each single wire separately, and then we can add the inter-wire interactions perturbatively and see what kind of instabilities the systems are coming. And then we can do the numerical solutions to probe that actually we are saying something which is correct. So if one now takes a single wire, so if now first we concentrate on this single wire here, so the physics of interacting bosons in, in a single wire, now we can uh, replace the, the, the total Hamiltonian by an, an effective Hamiltonian, which is an harmonic Hamiltonian, so-called Lattinger liquid, in which you basically have just density fluctuations and phase fluctuations of a field which is in, in a description, in a, a dynamic description basically is just given by uh, a density and an exponential which has a phase inside. So if you plug this, this field inside your original Hamiltonian, you end up with this kind of harmonic uh, Hamiltonian that you can clearly solve. And what is important here is that you immediately have, everything is expressed in terms of uh, of some parameter kappa and some velocity, and now kappa is what determines the decay of correlation function. So if you plot density correlation function, they decay like, for example, one, uh, one over x to the 2k, and also the, uh, the single particle correlation function are related to kappa. So if you know kappa, then you basically know how the system behaves as a, as a many-body system. Now, it turns out that uh, usually kappa is a phenomenological parameter that you can extract either, either from numerics or from exact, exact solution, for example, for, for interacting bosons uh, with short-range interaction. Otherwise, you have to do numerics, essentially. It turns out that for, for power low potential, with, uh, uh, which decay like 1 over x to the beta, and beta is larger than 1, so Coulomb does not work, uh, then you can write down an expression which is almost exact, so it's an approximation that works quite well. Uh, for example, here I'm plotting this expression here um, for kappa, this, uh, this effective parameter, as a function 
of the combination of the density and the dipole length, which is defined here, mass dipole squared, um, yeah, over h bar squared. And you can see that if you just, uh, if you go from very weak interactions to very strong <coughs> interaction, this is an analytic prediction, these are numerical data, and they work quite well, which means, okay, so we have a way to parameterize the interaction, uh, the, the effective interaction between a single wire, uh, essentially for any strength of interaction, this is quite useful to do the next thing. That if you take now the, the basically we, we can solve each one of these two layers independently, two, two wires independently. And now this is the original Hamiltonian, which has the Hamiltonian for a single layer. We can solve and then some coupling. And we can now rewrite it in terms of an effective Hamiltonian where we can solve this. And then we have an effective coupling, which has two terms, one which is quadratic and one which is not. And so if you, you can see the quadratic one is just basically a coupling of the density fluctuations. And so all this to say the following thing, that if you have a quadratic term, you can just re-diagonalize your Hamiltonian for basically this piece here. And then you get two other Latinger liquids, which are now coupled. You have new fields, which are basically a combination of the original fields. Now, for example, the density is, uh, comes as a plus-minus combination of the density in the two wires. And then you have some effective kappa also, which also is a combination of basically the, the new kappa, for example, for um, so-called spin, which is the, the pairing, will become the pairing, is, is just the original kappa uh, divided by one uh, plus some coupling and then some kappa again. Now, this is all fine. You can solve this. But the point is that the second term uh, has a, gives right to a San Gordon form. So it basically comes out that this guy here looks like a cosinus. And if you have an Hamiltonian, which is like a Latin liquid plus this cosinus term, you know immediately that there is somewhere a phase transition from a non-gapped phase to a gapped phase. And in this case, the gap is in the spin sector, which just means you always have a pairing. Now, this is very standard. So I'm just repeating basically a textbook. Okay? <laughs> so it's not like we invented anything here. But so I just wanted to say that if you have a, a situation in which you have uh, the same number of particles in the two layers, we recover immediately that there, there has to be a situation when there is pairing between the two. And actually, it turns out to be here that if you look at the expression that we have, we have kappa divided by 1 plus uh, some number which is positive. So then this guy is, has to be less than 1. Well, it's just the minus. They have to be less than 1. And therefore, it is, uh, we are always in the gap phase, which means we recover the, th the thing which we expect to see that there is always a gap, and therefore there, there is always pairing between two particles, one here and one here, no matter what is the strength of interaction. So what we learn qualitatively is that we have, at the few-body level, there is always a gap for dimers in the situation where you have the same number of particles in each, each tube is the same. On the many-body side, we know that there should be a stable liquid made of this dimer. OK, so this is not very surprising. Now, can we extend this? So our question was, if we take now a situation like this, in which in one wire we have a heavy, very heavy particle, and in the other wire we have a few very fast uh, and light particles, for a bono per hundred picture in which the mass one is much less than mass two, and the dipole maybe is a bit larger than the other one, you would expect that you should be able to bind these guys here by having a fast particles which attract all of the other ones. And so you should be able, in principle, from a bono per hundred picture, when the kinetic energy is very small, uh, the global kinetic energy is very small, you should be able to form a bound state of this object. So in principle, you should have a possibility of forming bound states for any, uh, any ratio of densities in, in the two layers, as long as you're, you have enough mass imbalance and, a, and enough uh, possibility of changing your dipole strength. So, you can do the same kind of approximate analysis we have just uh, uh, analytic solution that we have just seen. And you also find that for any ratio between the density in the two layers, you always find, again, a, a situation in which you have a term like this, which should give you a possibility of having a gap phase. And so also have a stable liquid for basically any ratio that, of particles that you get in the two layers. But of course, this is very approximate. Um, and, and so you cannot really say it from an analytic point of view if it works or not and where it works. And so now you have to, 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 to go back and do, uh, for example, the energy calculations that you can do in one dimension and check for the existence of stable trimer liquids for some given mass imbalance. Now, from the analytics, you immediately see, if you plot what the effective kappa is, is that this will only work if you have a very large mass imbalance and a, strong, a, a, a little bit of imbalance in densities. And so it 
will also be favored for the low, so it, is, it would be simpler, you see it from this analytics, it would be simpler uh, to form trimers, for example, than tetramers. You will, uh, so having tetramers will mean that you, if you want to form a bound state of this guy with three guys, you have to have very large mass imbalance, essentially. So we started looking at the simpler situation, quote, in which you have basically at most, say, a, a, a situation in which you try to bind uh, two particles here with one particle here, so trimers. To do that, uh, as I said, we looked at the lattice version of, of, the, of the Hamiltonian we had before. So uh, we basically put particles on the lattice, and now we have a kinetic energy. This is the Hamiltonian. We have a kinetic energy for each particle hoping in each uh, uh, different wire, and then we have some on-site interwire dipole-dipole attraction. So if two particles are sitting on the same site I, but in different wires, they can attract each other via dipole-dipole interactions. And now 1 and 2 uh, signifies the two different wires, and G is the distance between them. And also we have, uh, well, as depicted here, actually. Okay. So then, uh, and then we have this term here is just the off-site interwire dipole-dipole repulsion. So if the particle here and here, they can repel each other. And then we also have the intra-wire uh, repulsion, which is always a repulsion given by dipole-dipole interaction. So this is basically just rewriting a lattice model, what we had before. We expect that this Hamiltonian gives the same physics of the other Hamiltonian as long as the density of the, the particles is much, um, is much smaller, basically, than, uh, than the lattice spacing. So when the lattice spacing becomes a discretization, you, you have one particle every few lattice size, then the low energy physics should be the same. The lattice effects will come by the fact that you have a bounded kinetic energy, and so you, can also, um, so you have some qualitative differences in your quantitative differences in your phase diagram, and also you have possibly uh, different solids. OK. Now, end of uh, words, and now let's see what the results are. Maybe this is more interesting. OK, so this is, we start from the simplest uh, case. Uh, again, we go back to the uh, two pairing of two particles only in a balanced situation, just to get used to it. So now we have a we, we take f to start the, the, the same dipoles for the same species of particle here and here, which means same dipole in the two wires, same hoping uh, open in the lattice, and a density of maybe 0 0.2 in lattice units. And here I'm plotting the, the, uh, the dipole strength, and here is the interlayer, interwire separation, which is all you can change. And now you expect immediately that you have the following situation, that you have a dimer liquid. So we said that there is always a pair phase. And so you expect to have a liquid of, of pair dimers in the system, a charge density wave, which only means basically you still have a liquid, but is, is a very strong interacting liquid. And then, if you, if, and then you have some commensurability effect with the lattice. So if the lattice is commensurate with your density, then you can also open a gap in your system and form a true crystal with a gap. And this, you, you know, immediately, basically, but from, yeah, you immediately know that from also analytics, and you just need a few scans with the DMRG code to check that we actually are uh, capturing the right physics and we're putting the boundaries of the phases where they are. So the way in which we, uh, we decide in what phase we are, we look at the decay of the correlation functions. And as we said, the decay of the correlation function, for example, the dynamic correlation function, which is psi delta, psi delta, psi psi in the different Basically, is the pair in the position, the correlation in the position of the particles. You get uh, of the sorry, well, it's a dega state, it's not really a position, it's a, it's a dega state, dega size size. So um, is is given by the decay of, of some kappa parameter, as we have said before, and also density density, density correlation uh, decay like the same thing. And now, in the way in which we decide uh, in which phase we are. Uh, it depends on the, relative, uh, on the relative strength of this correlation versus this correlation. So if this correlation dominates, then we are in a dimer, uh, in this, what we call dimer liquid. Otherwise, we are in a charge density wave. If we focus, uh, if we focus uh, on uh, this one only, this will have, both in this phase and in this phase, the power law decay as plotted here in, the, in green. However, in this phase here, this will decay very fast. And once you cross a boundary, go towards a crystal, this decays exponentially. And this is a clear situation, this is a clear signature. So the decay of the correlation function as a function of distance signals in what phase you are. This is very standard again. You can also measure the gap of the, of the system. 
and here we just plot a few, uh, a few points for corresponding to certain parameters. I just want to mention here that you can actually measure the gap for, this, for the two particles. As, uh, here I'm plotting as a function of dipole strength. And we just checked that, as we expect, even for very weak dipoles here, we still find a gap, a finite gap. So we are also recovering what we expect, that the system should be, should be gap no matter how far apart you take it away, it should be gap. Of course, it will, it will be impossible to observe the gap if you take the particles, the, the, the wires away. For example, if you take lithium cesium molecules in a deep lattice with um, confinement 100 kilohertz and a spacing of maybe 400 nanometers, or it's nanometers, you get gaps of order of a micro Kelvin or so. And this should be possible to observe. And this is also, again, checking that we understand how it works. And now this is more interesting. If you now start having population imbalance, if you start having more particles in, wire, in this wire than in this wire, then you have uh, more, many more parameters, so you have to start making choices in your system. And so what we choose is to have a low density. We go to low density limit, and we take a specific ratio of the dipole strength between the two. So we choose a, a, a dipole imbalance. This is not crucial, but we choose that the second, uh, so this guy is six times larger than the other dipole. We fix the inter interlayer distance to lambda half. So, and then, uh, uh, okay, and then we take this density. And now we see these three phases. Um, as a function, so I'm plotting now the phase diagram as a function of dipole strength and the ratio between the two kinetic energy, which is basically the masses. Okay, so basically we have two things. If the, if the, the mass ratio is not, so if, if we have a, the same number, basically the same velocities for the two parts, the same mass for the two particles, or a not large enough mass imbalance, you always have two independent lattice liquids. So unlike before, now we need a quite of an imbalance in the mass in order to be able to, to, to bind trimers here. So if you, if you don't do that, you have two independent lattice liquids. Now, if you, um, if you now have a sufficiently large imbalance in the mass between the two things, which you can also tune by the depth of the lattice, for example, then you can enter a phase where you see this uh, trimer, I try to picture here, uh, if you have a, a large enough uh, also interactions, you can, you can actually bind, as you would expect exactly from bono perhammer approximation. You would expect that bono perhammer we have said before, will work when this particle is fast enough to bind the, these lower the lower particle here, and this is exactly what we find here. For large dense uh, mass imbalance, we can, we can obtain a, a trimer liquid phase. And we, we see the characterization later. Now, what is interesting is also that if you have too strong uh, interactions, then you enter a phase separated state, as you would also expect. In a sense, if you have that your interactions, we'll see later, but basically, you see, if you have too strong interaction, you force uh, this particle here to choose in between the other two, and this will make a phase separated state overall. Okay, so now if you want to characterize these phases, you, in, in, for example, in an experiment, in a theoretically, you, you have to check the following thing. How do we see a trimer, for example, a trimer liquid? As we said before, we have to check for the decay of correlation function and check which one is dominant. Now, if you plot the trimer correlation function is this guy, is, uh, C dega, C dega, C dega, C dega, C, C, C. So if, you know, now you have to keep track of three particles in the lattice. And this is the green uh, dash dotted line here. And you see that this is the only one which decays as a function of distance. Um, uh, it decays uh, algebraically, while both the dimer one and the single particle one, which are these two guys here, decay exponentially. So basically, in the trimer liquid phase, the only correlation function which does not decay is the one for a liquid of trimers, uh, which is delocalized. And if you now uh, want instead, if you now cross this boundary here and enter here, as you would expect, so you should be able to observe two independent Lattinger liquids, unlike the, the balance case for we had before. In this case, what you would see is that they, all the correlation function decay the same way. There is no, maybe this one is a bit lower, a trimer is not favorable, but a single particle and two particle correlation function decay basically the same way. So if you are able to probe this kind of correlation function, then you would clearly see the difference between the two. If you want to see the phase separation, you have to plot the density. And now I'm plotting here a, the density uh, in, in the phase separated state, which again is for, is for a situation where the dipole-dipole attraction between the two layers is much larger than the kinetic energies. 
In that case, you get a, this kind of state, which is interesting by itself. This is a, a, a microscopic uh, phase separation, which means the following thing. That, for example, here in blue, I'm plotting the density in, the, in, the, in, the, in, uh, in um, tube 1, in the lower density situation. And you see that in red is the density of the other, of the, actually, sorry, I, I got the opposite uh, color than here, sorry. <laughs> I didn't notice that, just notice now. So anyway, the color code is inverse between blue and red here. So but what you see here is that's basically the following thing, that if you, um, if you plot, for example, at a certain point in the lattice, you will see that two particles, you, you have two particles which are paired as depicted here, which means the density of these two guys is exactly the same here. And then, uh, and then you have the, the red, and then you know, we have a situation in which you have a single unpaired particle, excess particle here. Basically, you're you forming a mixture of dimers, single particle, dimers, single particle, dimers, single particle, which try to crystallize. OK, so all this is fine, but the point is all these phases are very interesting, but if you are in an experiment, can we actually see it? Um, and this means if we, put, if we put, for example, an external parabolic potential, which we know is, is very important, and uh, is this, all this going to survive or die? So this is what we, we, we do here. And so here I'm plotting, uh, we, we, did a, we repeated now the calculation only numerically. And we check that if we add the parabolic potential, like here, for both particles, and um, now what happens in that system? Now we have to find a way to check for now the other parameter for the trimers, and we decide that this is a good one. So we look for the, um, we take just the, uh, the difference in density uh, between the two species, the, the majority and minority species, and we check that if this number, basically, if you multiply twice in a single site, twice the, uh, the, the density of this guy with respect to this guy, and we subtract the density of this guy, so the fluctuations of the, of the relative density must be much less than one to define pair in this system. And this is the result. And this is quite interesting, because basically, we have here underlying potential like this. And if you put, for example, um, a parabolic confinement and some also excess particles, because in an experiment, you cannot really control the number of particles here or here perfectly. So we, we, we decide that we maybe have in, the, in, the, in, the, in one of the layers, we have twice the population than the other layers, but also we add a few particles more. This is what you find if you look at the density profile. In black, now we have the population in, uh, in, uh, in one of the tubes. And in red, you have the population of the other tube. And you see immediately that if you multiply this, this by two, we recover the, the density in the other tube, which means that now we have, we, in all this system here, uh, we have basically formation of trimers. That's what it means. <coughs> and uh, the difference in densities between these fluctuations of the density in, all, in the system here is 10 to the minus 8. So it, which means that this number is 10 to the minus 8, which means this is a trimer phase. So what we have is that we have a trimer. We have, what we found is that we always have a, a kind of a wedding cake structure in the density profile in which the heavier particles sit at the center. So if you have now a system, you just throw your whatever density you have. If you have a confining potential, exactly like um, for the experiments with, say, in optical lattices, uh, in which you have this uh, you know, wedding cake structure that you get by the uh, competition with the lattice, here you also get it just for three particles. You get that the heavier composite particles, like trimers, stay at the uh, center. Then you have dimers and then single particles outside. So it's it kind of robust to the presence of defects, uh, like excess particles. Uh, the, the, the existence of these phases are robust to defects, which are excess particles, uh, et cetera. OK, this was quite reassuring, because if it, this was not the case, all this would be essentially experimentally unobservable. So we are happy that this uh, is OK. So how is time? Uh, not super good time. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so how much? Five minutes? Well, Three, yeah. two, one. In principle, there are questions. Minus one. Uh, okay, so let me just two two slides. So the other idea was cooling molecules with a Liberato reservoir, and I just want to. This is very recent work we just uh, finished recently. I think it's very exciting that we just want to give a shorter, uh, short, um, short idea. So the idea was the following: um, Can we? Uh, so if one does simple, for example, sympathetic cooling of molecules uh, by scattering with uh, cold atoms, then Often happens that if you just take a random atom, any molecule, that could be chemistry, a short range. And also, the, um, the scattering rate can be pretty low. 
uh, for high temperature particles, for low densities. So as we said before, we want to find a way in which we can increase this cross-section between atom molecule collision, and we do that by uh, using so-called blue shielding techniques, which means using a laser to engineer interaction between molecules and read their atoms. And also, we want to engineer spontaneous emission from the Rydberg state in such a way that a photo can take away the collision energy and possibly cool of the order of maybe millikelvin uh, um, in each collision between atom and molecule. And so the idea to do, to do that is just the following. I will not enter details, but just give the, the flavor of what it is. So we have a fast molecule we scatter against the cold atom. Now the atom is in the ground state. However, there is an off resonant uh, laser which couples to some properly chosen Rydberg state, and this is always on. When the atom, uh, so when the molecule comes close to maybe 250 nanometers to the, at the, that distance to the molecules, the atom gets laser excited conditional to the molecule coming to close to this distance, and this is using some so-called blue shielding techniques. This can increase the atom molecule cross-section enormously because now the cross-section, the impact parameter is maybe 250 nanometers. And now, if the molecules come even closer, we engineer using again these uh, blue shielding techniques. We engineer spontaneous emission, meaning that we transfer the atomic population to a second state, which decays very fast, and then the photon takes away the collision energy, and so now the molecule can go out uh, cold. And uh, if you look at the bottom behind the potential for this. Uh, this would be something uh, in a rough scheme, something like this. So the molecule, if you take the atoms at some position, the molecule comes in, climbs up the interaction potential below 300 nanometers created by the laser for the atom molecule collision. Then when it comes closer, maybe 200 nanometers, you make it flat by having a second laser which transfers the atomic population to a second state where now the atom decays very fast to a second ground state which is basically not interacting with the molecule, the molecule goes out. This is a level scheme. So you have the rotational excitation of the molecules. So the way in which we couple atom and molecules is, is by engineering with laser light uh, resonant uh, interactions between the rotational excitation of the molecule and the excited electronic states of the atom, which are basically <laughs> the same spacing, and we can tune this interaction using laser fields. And we, in the basic scheme, we need a couple of lasers. This is not ideal, but uh, is, so far is the best we can do. So. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Thanks okay, so. okay, well. Yeah, so I have a question concerning this charge density wave phase that you seem to find uh, uh, in, in all cases. Uh, before entering the, 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 the crystal phase, you always seem to have this charge density wave. For the, for the balanced for the balance system. Balanced, yes. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering uh, whether this is, uh, is something peculiar of one dimension or uh, could be uh, also the case in, in two dimensions. So I, I am imagining uh, so the, the, the whether at zero temperature going from the superfluid to the crystal in 2D, uh, you, al you also have some... Uh, well, so there it would be hard to de define what... The the charge density way, so how do you define exactly? So you want to let really check about like, well, no, a triangular crystalline, yeah. a liquid crystal. Yeah, so, well, uh, okay, so to the stripe phase that uh, seem to be present in, uh, in the Fermi case. Right, so I would be curious too, because they, they would correspond to basically a super solid on the, uh, if you had, because you had, would have superfluidity and density modulation. Now, if you ask me, so if you had asked me this three years ago, I would have said no. <laughs> like now, we say, yeah, <laughs> maybe. And the reason for that is the following: that um, okay, so it is one of our Q potential, this one, and this uh, should have an intermediate phase between the liquid and the solid phase, and this phase should be a micro emulsion phase if it was fermions. Sorry, yeah. Micro emulsion phase. Now, the corresponding micro emulsion phase for bosons is a bit unclear what should be. It could be a super solid or not. In the super solid would be exactly what you are saying. But nobody has calculated that. In a sense, we tried. And if there is, it is in the error bus of what we calculated. The error bus are pretty narrow. Um, so far, nobody has done better. But if somebody does it, it's, I think it's still open. So it's a very good question. Yeah, so the, in the first part of the talk, you had all these pictures of two wire systems. But experimentally, it's going to be hard to have 
exactly two wires. It's much more natural to have an array of wires. Have you thought about, you know, is, is there going to be qualitatively different behavior if you have? Yes. So there is actually, so there are several studies actually put a slide about that. So there are several studies now also people looking at filaments, for example. What happens if you have uh, filaments? That's very interesting by itself because then other transition just by the linking of these filaments and the unbinding of the filaments. And also um, there was very recent work uh, by two groups uh, which looked at the so basically, you can map being in the, one of the two wires in spin models, and in this case, would be a spin model where you have, you have full symmetry. So in this case, you do. If you have a larger system, you don't have because you cannot couple the upper, the upper. Um, so you don't have full symmetry, full spin symmetry because you cannot couple the upper wire to the lower one in the same way. It's not circular. So you can, it's not like graphene. You can <laughs> wrap it up. Uh, and so this gives rise to actually interesting phenomena by, the, by itself. So I haven't looked at it, but there are other people who started looking at it. Oh, sorry, I fear in the interest of time, maybe. Okay, you, you already yeah. want to. Okay. <laughs> One more. So I have this uh, question. Again, part one. Is any of that transferable to the usual quantum liquids, helium-3, helium-4? Um, uh, if you put them in 1D, yeah. well, you have to find a way to, to um, well, you have to find one, one way to, to, class, to make a little class, stable little clusters, right? So, you would have, so the, the problem there is the interaction potential, which is, the interaction potential, so, sorry, which one? You're thinking of the wires now. So you're thinking of the wire, physics of the wires and multi-composite wires, composite. Well, oh, let's start with wires, because if, if this is doable in number of lines, I can sure. know, not Sure. In a channel, yeah. Can, yes. Uh, yeah. So people are, th are thinking of that, and they are doing latin gel liquid, you know, of, of uh, helium-4, for example, and showing that if you put helium-4 in a channel, it behaves like a latin gel liquid, and et cetera. So in the sense, yes, now the pairing of them, you have to find a way to have pairing across tubes, and I'm not aware that, uh, of ways to engineer interactions which are long range for this kind of systems. If one could come up with that, it would be yes, but so far I don't know of at least of, of ways to, to get longer range interactions between these uh, microscopic elements. But if yes, yes. So this will be pretty general as long as one can find a way to link the particles without by suppressing suppressing global clustering of the system. So you don't want to have everything becoming a chunk of 